Hello and welcome to the MB Om podcast, where you will learn to master the business of yoga with guests from around the world who have experienced becoming successful yoga teachers, studio owners, and much more. Now, here's your host, Amanda Kingsmith. Hello and welcome to another episode of the MB Om podcast. I'm so excited that you've decided to join me today. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Fave Yogis. Here's a business tool that's really going to change the lives of yoga teachers. Do you teach yoga? Then this app is for you. The Fave Yogis app puts control and freedom into your hands. You can update your schedule, offer your own classes anywhere, anytime, and get paid all from your phone. No more updating your schedule in multiple places for students to maybe stumble across it. Students simply open Fave Yogis and your schedule will be there. With Fave Yogis, you can receive donations or tips from students, send students notifications about class updates, set prices and ticket availability, and auto send reminders to students. Just your yoga, teachers add classes, students add teachers, students and teachers stay connected. Head on over to your app store and get the Fave Yogis app for free. It's F-A-V-Y-O-G-I-S. And when you sign up, make sure you use code M-B-O-M and let them know that I sent you. Now, before we dive into today's episode, I have two other quick updates. One you've heard about for a couple weeks now and that that's lo- that I've launched a new project called Yoga Business Bootcamp. Yoga Business Bootcamp is a 12-week online course that takes you from the dream job creation stage through to building your website, designing your resume, getting jobs at studios, building out your business, creating your brand, and learning all about how to build out a successful sales funnel. It takes you from step one through step 12. And the great thing about it is that you can buy any module along the way if you feel like you're just struggling with a couple different things in your business, or you can get the entire program. And even better than that, if you're like, I can't afford this, or, you know, I'm not sure if this is right for me, I've developed a podcast and a video series. So head on over to iTunes, search Yoga Business Bootcamp, and you can listen to the different weekly things that we're talking about. So I go week by week through all of the different things that Yoga Business Bootcamp is about. Episode four just came out last week, and I'd be so, so happy if you could go check it out. If you prefer video, you can head on over to YouTube, search Amanda Kingsmith or MBOM, and you can watch the videos as well. Of course, if you have any questions or anything like that, you can always reach out to me at info at mbmyoga.com and ask me anything that you want to know. I know that diving into any type of big course or spending your money, you know, it's, it's hard earned and I totally get that as a yoga teacher. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out. Final announcement before I introduce today's guest is that I'm so excited to be a part of the Yoga Goddess Academy online teacher training. So you heard from Crystal Gray a number of episodes you know, back, she was talking about divine feminine. She was talking about creating an online business. And I absolutely love what she's done with Yoga Goddess Academy. Crystal is going to be the lead teacher. And then there's a number of other teachers who are going to be a part of the training, myself included. So of course, I'm going to be doing the business aspect. So if you're looking for an amazing teacher training, either in person or online, uh, you can head on over to bit.ly, so B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash Amanda Y-T-T. And again, if you have any questions about this, don't hesitate to reach out to me. All right, on to today's episode. This week, I'm joined by Andrew Gordon from the Yoga Moves You podcast. Andrew has been a yoga teacher, a yoga studio owner. He's worked in radio. He owns a podcasting company, and he has his own yoga podcast. I was fortunate enough to be a guest on his podcast a number of weeks ago, and now I'm super excited to share this episode with Andrew. Now, before we dive into this episode, I do have to acknowledge, I said on his podcast, and I told him that his episode would be out last week. I completely forgot. I put out Colin Vosberg's episode. So I just want to publicly acknowledge and apologize. Andrew, I'm so sorry I screwed this up, but your episode is here for everyone to listen to. And I hope you guys really, really enjoy it. All right. Here's Andrew. I'm very excited to be joined on the podcast today by Andrew Gordon from Yoga Moves You. Welcome to the show today, Andrew. Thank you so much, Amanda. It's a pleasure to be on your show. Yeah, I'm super excited to be chatting with you today. You're a fellow podcast host, you're a yoga teacher, we have so much in common. So I'm excited to dive into that. But I want to back up and talk about how you first got into yoga. Wow. Okay, so I got into yoga uh, in 2000. 
and one uh, late in 2001. And it was after uh, 9-11 happened and my dad had passed away suddenly of a heart attack who was presumably in good health on the outside, but under the hood, not so much. He was only 68. So he, had, he had passed away uh, 9-6 of 2001. So I lost my father and then 9-11 um, happened. And I was just really overwhelmed. Um, I was working in radio at that time, and I had taken a week off from my radio show to grieve for my, my father, and then 9-11 happened, and my station, which was a music station, was feeding the news through there. And then when I came, finally came back from grieving, and then 9-11, I was the first one to go back to music on the air, and um, there were threats that Anthrax was being mailed to the studio. It was just crazy. So my, my whole sense of security and like what was normal just like flew out the door. So I needed something, and a friend suggested yoga. Um, and this, the yoga studio that I ended up going to was and is – still run by a gentleman who was a volunteer firefighter uh, on Long Island in New York. The sub suburban fire departments are volunteer in the city. They're, they're full-time and paid. But on 9-11, everyone came in. And his studio uh, is by my mom's house still. And someone suggested to go there. And he had told me what had gotten him through the chaos of 9-11 that day was his yoga and that him and his wife wanted to open up a studio when they both retired from their whatever their regular day jobs were. Um, but then after that day, it was like, life is short. We need to open up the studio. And that's from there on, that's how I got into it. And um, I just felt something different. I had always been into sports. I had worked out. But the, the, the mind you know, slowing things down and not being reactive, that, that was something that was unique that I, I knew that I needed in my life. Mm -hmm. And that was it from there. Yeah. Wow. That's an incredible story. And like, what a way to come to yoga after like these massive, massive traumas in your life. Yeah. It, it's, I mean, it was a gift. It still is. It's always be a gift. Yeah. And so what inspired you to take that from, you know, practitioner to teacher? Okay, good question. Yes, yeah, so I was practicing uh, for a number of years, and I did radio. I was a radio host and, and did that and traveled around as a programmer and a host uh, for about 10 years. And when I turned 30, I decided to go back to get my master's to teach English as a second language. And I started teaching in the public schools and I went to a yoga studio um, where I am right now in Charlotte, North Carolina, because I could not get it. When I graduated with my master's, it was 2009, and that was obviously right after the Great Recession. So, you know, jobs were not happening. Uh, and I got ended up finally finding a teaching job in Charlotte, North Carolina. My aunt and uncle had been down here since 87. So I came down here and taught, and I needed to find a yoga studio that had like a 430 class because I would I would work during the day. And since I came out with no job after getting my master's, I wanted to hustle. Like, if there was a minute in a day, I was working. So I was like, I'm, after my teaching job during the day, I'm going to deliver pieces at night. You know, but, but I wanted that yoga class in between. And this one studio had a 420 class. The first teacher who taught me there, uh, which I had on the, my podcast, uh, Melissa Fiorenza, um, she taught that class and made me fall in love with that studio. And... I was dating a girl. I'm married now. It was the girl I was dating before my wife. And we had broken up right before, like, Valentine's Day. Like, really. Like, probably like a week before Valentine's Day. And my friend Melissa, who is the teacher I was referencing, she was teaching a heart opening class on Valentine's Day. And I was crying in Shavasana. And I, she kept telling me because she, was, she used to be a teacher, an art teacher in the public school. So we had that, like, kind of similar thread. She's like, you should do teacher training. You know, you should just go for it. I was like, ah, I don't know. And the training had actually started their first weekend probably like two weeks before that heart opening class. And it, when I was crying in Shavasana, I got up and I go, I'm going to do the training. <laughs> and, that was it. and that was it from there. 
That's amazing. Um, <laughs> this is like totally side note, but apparently it's actually really common for a lot of people to break up right before holidays. Um, I think it's because like if you're kind of thinking that you don't want to be in the relationship anymore, it's that you you don't have to buy a gift then as horrible as that is. Well, I don't know. I was the one that was broken up with. So <laughs> <Doesn't> <laughs> maybe she it, didn't want to buy me a gift. Yeah. It doesn't make it better, <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's interesting that yoga, you know, you came to yoga out of a place of, you know, hurting and then came to yoga teacher training in kind of the same way. Yeah. So, um, entering training into that place of really heartbreak, and feeling like I was, you know, broken emotionally and a lot of, you know, it was rough. I really thought that I was going to marry um, that particular girl, um, which ironically is the girl I did before I did get married. When I went into yoga teacher training, I was in this place of growth and just really investigating who I am from the core, being broken down through my training, uh, you know, through self-study and learning a lot more about myself than I've ever learned in those six months coming out of that training in a place of feeling so self-aware and positive and empowered that that's what I brought, the energy that I brought to everything that I did that I didn't mind being alone after the training. And I was like, you know, if I never meet anyone else and I never get married, I'm okay because I'm in this good place. And that's when I met my wife. <laughs> it's so interesting how, you know, it's it's this time where you kind of realize, like, you know, I'm okay on my own. And then that person comes into your world. I mean, I feel like it's not coincidence. Like, it, it, it has to be the fact that you're, you're not, I feel like not seeking or maybe not, I don't want to use the word desperate, but it's kind of the word that comes to mind. Like, you're not feeling like you need this person anymore. And then, you know, it's the perfect time for somebody to enter your life. Yeah. Yes, I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. And and I also think there's something to the energy that you project that. And I don't know, I would have to ask my she's not here right now. But if she were here, I'd ask her um, if the energy I projected and, and other people do when they're in that place of feeling like I'm OK alone and I'm truly OK, is that people wonder what what about them makes them feel so okay with being alone you know mm -hmm. and yeah. it's like almost like a a wonderment about what the self-confidence or so i hate using the word self-confidence because it teeters on arrogance but i don't want to come from that place but just the, the feeling of being okay yeah How about that feeling yeah of being yeah content. yeah definitely Santosha. yeah for sure and so so you graduated from this teacher training and at this point were you still you know doing the hustle between teaching teaching like, yes. school and delivering pizzas and that sort of thing? Yes. So I was teaching for, left a public school, but I was teaching at a place called ELS, and they have centers all over the U.S. and the world. Um, Berlitz is the parent company. And I was teaching there um, full time. I'd get off at three. And then instead of delivering pizzas, I would teach yoga. Like, you know, so I substitute yoga instead, of, but I would go all over the place. I mean, I would teach at a gym. It was my first gig. And then I ended up teaching for a smaller studio. I would sub at the studio that I trained at, which is the big, you know, one of the biggest studios here in Charlotte. Um, and then I would teach. Somehow I landed a corporate gig where it's like a laboratory and these scientists with like Speakers and, and lab coats would come in and take class. Like when it, was, it, was, it was so much fun. It was so interesting, you know, like bouncing around from place to place. Um, and then eventually what happened was I connected at the studio that I practiced at where I did my training with a doctor. And the doctor is a, he, he is a rheumatologist. And I don't even know because I, I swear to you, Amanda, I barely taught there. Like I saw if I was lucky, like you know, once every two weeks. And I don't know how he knew I was a teacher. And I never spoke to this gentleman. But in the locker room after our class that we took, he said to me, hey, I, I want you to, um, to teach, to teach my, at my workplace. And I didn't even know what he did or I didn't even know this man. I swear, I, I'm being serious. I don't know how this happened. Um, and I said, well, what do you mean? Like, you want me to teach English? Because he's actually his name is Ali. 
and he spoke in accent. So I was like, maybe he knows that I like, I teach English to as a second language. And I was like, you want me to teach your workers? He he told me. I said, well, do, do you have people that speak a second language there? And he's like, no, no, I want you to teach them yoga. I said, okay. Uh, what kind of workplace is it? Just so I I know. And he goes, it's a it's a doctor's office, a rheumatologist. I said, okay. So I went there to teach his workers. And after that, he goes, I want you to teach my patients. I was like, okay. So on the weekends, I would come into his waiting room and I would take the, the puzzle piece floor, like the gray little like deck hockey or like kids flooring. Mm -hmm. And I would build a floor for six students in his waiting room and have three classes every Saturday and every Sunday for people with like fibromyalgia and rheumatoid arthritis and seniors. And he said to me, I think you should form a corporation. And he kind of mentored me in the business side of things. I had no clue. And then from there, I had a vision of, you know, buying a studio eventually. And then it just kind of happened, manifested. Yeah. Wow. That's so interesting that those just, <laughs> things kind of just like fell into place. And so because this was like very organic for you, I don't know if you have like a good answer to this question, but I'm curious if somebody out there is listening and they are interested in getting into kind of more like corporate gigs or sure. things outside of the box. Like, do you have any tips for getting those, getting those opportunities? Yeah. Don't hesitate to make the phone call or send the email, you know, you know, don't, don't, don't hesitate to reach out and think that you're going to get rejected. And then, to further on that thought, if you if you do get rejected, move on, you know, because there's a million workplaces and, and, and you know, don't limit yourself. If you limit yourself, you're going to be limited. Right. Mm -hmm. So you'll be surprised once you start reaching out how receptive some people are, because somebody who you might talk to loves yoga and is going to be your biggest champion and advocate to get it into their workplace. So you know, just follow your gut and go and go with it. You know, you have nothing. What do you have to lose? You have everything to gain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that people got to get caught up in this like idea that, you know, people saying no is really scary. And like, I mean, it's definitely it doesn't feel good when somebody says no, that they don't want your services. But at the same time, if you don't ask, you never open up that opportunity for a yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you know, most of the time, people in the workplace are not really going to seek you out in my experience. But when you, I mean, it happened a couple of times, but overall the corporate gigs that I did get were certainly because I reached out and you'd be surprised, you know, people are really receptive. Not everyone's just going to hang up the phone on you or not answer your email. Um, wellness in the workplace is a big deal. Mm hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think that it's like, you know, becoming bigger and bigger every day. Like, it seems like more and more companies are doing like fitness challenges or like take the stair challenges or do yoga at lunchtime and that sort of thing. And anytime they do things like that, they need a yoga teacher. And, and another thing to think about from the business side of things is, you know, they can lower their insurance premiums as a whole, as a company by having something like that in there. So there, there, there's, there's all these incentives that are in your favor as a yoga instructor. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And so you mentioned that, you know, from there you wanted to own a yoga studio. Did you end up owning a yoga studio? Yeah. So the studios that I was teaching at like once a week was coming down to their final like months of that owner, um, the, the, the lease and the owner was not going to renew. So at that, at that point, I was looking around just a general area for a studio. Literally, I, Amanda, I swear, the day that I was looking at the neighboring, you know, part of Charlotte, you know, the next area over, I was driving through this subdivision, my head out the window, screaming at people. I thought I was crazy, I think. And there was a shopping center right next to the subdivision. I said, hey. You guys can walk to that shopping center. You think the yoga studio would be good there? <laughs> it's like screaming at people. <laughs> so, and then my phone rang. And as my phone rang, it was the, the owner of the other studio I was working at. And she's like, are you interested in buying the studio? Because, you know, I'm really, I'm not looking to renew the lease. And I did have a buyer and they backed out. 
and I said, where are you? She goes, I'm at the studio. I go, I'll be right there. And so I went there and I looked over the books, which if you're ever thinking of buying a studio, make sure you look at the books like inside and out, dig into the mind body or whatever system the people are using. Um, don't just take someone's word for it because they've been your buddy for the last three years. Uh, you know, business could change things. So you really got to do your homework. And uh, I went there. I met with her. And I, I knew a little bit about that studio because I taught there like one or two nights a week. So, so it's not like I was totally unfamiliar. But the scariest thing happened. I decided to buy it. And I went with her to the bank in the same shopping center where the yoga studio had existed for the last three years. And as I handed her the check, the banker said, I'm not gonna say I'm not gonna say the name of the studio, but XYZ's studio, where is that? And I pointed behind the banker's shoulder and I said, Over there, right next to the supermarket. And I was like, Holy crap, holy crap, do I have my work cut out for me? <laughs> was so does that mean that the this oh, like he didn't know about it and it was right there, if that's what you're saying? He goes to work there every day, and that studio has been there for three years, and he didn't know that there was a yoga studio there. Yeah, okay. For some reason, my head went to like, oh, no, there's like a legal problem with this. Like, it's not a legit business or something like that. No, no. And that, and th and that was after I handed the check over. I, in my mind, I was like, wait, give me that back. <laughs> You're like, I don't want to buy this. <laughs> but I knew I had my work cut out for me. But at the same time, I also knew that this particular um, owner – really was never present and that I was ready to be fully present and fully committed and talk about, you know, taking the studio from 10 classes a week to up to 30 and really do it the way that it, it needed to be. So I knew I was fully invested in it if I was going to do it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I'm sure there's like a ton of people out there listening who are curious about like all the different things that you learned and how you actually did grow the yoga studio. So can you talk a little bit about like, maybe some of the biggest learning curves that you had when you took that over? Oh, Lord. Okay, so <laughs> let me let me just let me just say that I I can talk about two different experiences. And I bought a second studio that we bought from the ground up. Okay, so that was fresh energy, as opposed to buying one. Even though these people knew me, I taught there like one or two nights a week, inheriting old students and remodeling. And, you know, the, the students are used to the way things looked and the way things were and the teachers who you inherit. And I ended up, without going too much into detail, I bought students out of their contracts so that they left. And... I only had to fire one teacher. The other teachers left because I was going to let them go anyway. Uh, and it's not like I'm this evil dictator. There were bad things done. Uh, and again, you know, I'm not, I can sit here and talk all day about all the things that were done. But I had a, long story short, I had to clear the energy and it was worth every single penny and every ounce of effort to do it. Because once I cleared it, the dividends that resulted and the growth in the studio that resulted after clearing those people out was was enormous, was worth it. Absolutely. And was that just sort of like, you know, people who were in line with your vision or people who were just, you know, kind of maybe dragging the studio down in one way or another? Like, how did you kind of know what direction to go in with that? You mean in like buying people out of their contracts? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean... I, I would take one of the teacher's classes and the, the students would be talking crap about me right in front of me. <laughs> and yeah. it's, I mean, like, that's how bad it was. Like, that's like worst case scenario. So, I mean, it was clear. It was clear. I mean, I, I certainly did not come in wanting to, to, to do what I did. I wanted to keep the peace and I wanted everyone to embrace the changes that I wanted to make, which was, you know, remodeling the studio, making it more modern and a, and a, and a, a younger approach. It tended to cater to an, a much older crowd. Um, and I think it just, you know, it just didn't, it didn't jive with, with, with a lot of the people who were regulars. And, you know, people don't like change. I, and it really hit me when I would go to the pharmacy in, in the Target here, right? And I knew the people who worked at the pharmacy. And I went there for years. And then all of a sudden, CVS 
took over the pharmacy part of Target here. And little by little, it's like the colors changed of their walls and my favorite workers weren't there anymore. And I said, that's what, the, that's what my students were feeling. That's why they resented me. And it, it just made sense to me. Yeah. Yeah, that's so interesting. I mean, people really do dislike change. And I know, I mean, I've experienced that as well. It's like, <laughs> and I can think about, you know, my favorite yoga studio as well. Like if it changed owners and went through a radical change, I feel like I'd be a, a little bit frustrated by that too. But at the same time, as a studio owner, I feel like you, you kind of have to do what you've got to do to make your business align with your vision. And then also if you're an owner that teaches a lot too, mm -hmm. that, that, that just like, it's tricky. It's very tricky. Um, now opening up a studio from the ground up, has another set of challenges, you know, but totally, totally different. Um, and certainly much more enjoy enjoyable challenges. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so, so you mentioned how, you know, you went to the bank and hand over this check to, to the guy who like had no idea that this studio existed across the street. <laughs> how were you able to get the word out? Like what was the process for getting people to know that the studio existed and upping, you know, attendance and that sort of thing? Well, okay, so and it, there was a couple of, of key factors, and um, it was adding a bunch of class to the schedule, and it was also being there. So there was a lot of foot traffic. We were right next to a cleaners, a nail salon, and, and like the big shop, uh, big grocery store, and most of the time the doors is closed under the old owner. So I would stay there, play music, leave the door open, and people would go, man, you know, I've been wanting to come in here. It's just it's always looked like it's closed. And then that like just started like, bam, foot traffic. But that was the first social media. I was a little, you know, I think I was more savvy and creative than the prior owner. Uh, there were some big events that I got us into uh, that, that gave us um, some brand awareness uh, in the area that, that they didn't have prior. So I just just really hustling. I don't know if you hustle things happen. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. I feel like, and maybe this is just human nature, like, I hear like passive income a lot. And I don't really feel like, I feel like you can definitely get to a place in a business where you can have, you know, continuous sales happening. Like if you're, if you have like a really popular course or workshop or yeah. book or something like that. But I, I think that people, people think about how, you know, oh, okay, you just get passive income, but there's so much hustle that goes into everyone who has, you know, some sort of stream of passive passive income. And I feel like, you know, people think the same with maybe the yoga industry, like, oh, you know, I love yoga, so I'll become a yoga teacher. But being a successful yoga teacher or studio owner, like you need to hustle or you're going to fail. Yeah. So, I mean, it goes back to when I was driving all over the place to like two different places each night after my day job, because I was so happy for the opportunity to teach, contrasting that with some of the newer teachers I hired um, at the new studio who were like, oh, I don't know, it's like gas money coming here. And I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? I was like, I, like, I don't know. I, I don't know what happened from the time I finished training to now, but it floored me. Yeah. I mean, I think it's like a, a type of person. Like, I, I think that there's, you know, still lots of people who are willing to make that hustle. But I think that yeah. there's lots of people who aren't. Like, they just want it to kind of be easy. And I think the reality of most things that are worth working for is that they're not easy. Exactly. And I think you have to look at it like a college degree doesn't guarantee that you're going to get a job. What guarantees you getting a job is hustling and making connections and getting out there. You can't just say, hey, look, hi, it's my paper. It's my teaching, it's my yoga teaching certificate. It's my college degree. It's like, that's, yeah, okay, that, that's, your, that's your pass. That, that's your ticket to get on a train. But, but now you got to, you know, in order to get a good seat, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you got to, got to muscle your way into it yeah yeah totally I, yeah i think that that's a great great analogy to use and i mean i can Thank think you. of so many examples with college degrees for sure but i think that people think the same in the yoga industry is like you know i've got this piece of paper that says i'm a yoga teacher now so you know where are the jobs where's my job and it's, it's like a fully saturated market so you i mean you have to be creative and be willing to maybe you take a job at the place that is not your dream place to teach at at first. And for me, I started at a gym, you know, but you know mm -hmm. what, that, that, that gave me the ability to find my voice and mess up and try things, you know? Oh yeah. A hundred percent. I mean, I think that <laughs> most of my classes for my first like six months teaching were free. Yeah. Just, just like, smart. 
I'm not going to say no to free classes when I have no teaching experience. Um, and I think that you can definitely get to a point where you, you can look at the value of that and say that it's not worth it for you. But I think that in the beginning, you really do need to take those opportunities. Like I taught a 6 a.m. class. I hate mornings. Like getting up at five <laughs> does not excite me in any way. But I taught like a regular 6 a.m. class for like eight months because I was like, I need I need to get this experience. It's my foot into the studio. Like it's such what? a good experience. And like Every Tuesday morning, I curse the fact that I had that class. But as soon as I was there teaching and afterwards, I was like, yeah, like, this is what I want to do. And this is what I've got to do to do this. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good lesson for everyone listening. You know, I, the, the the first studio that I own, um, I introduced 6 a.m. class. Of course, no one was going to teach it the first year. Eventually, I got teachers. But I do not like waking up that early. Uh, I taught that 6 a.m every freaking weekday for the whole year until I got teachers the second year. Oh, yeah, definitely. And I think that's something that people don't maybe realize as like, as a studio owner that you kind of have to do those things like they think like, Oh, it's so luxurious. I'm going to own the studio, I can choose my own schedule. And I think it definitely does have those perks. But at the same time, it's like, you know, you want to start a 6am class, and none of your teachers are going to teach it. So in order for it to happen, you need to make that happen. And you need to do it. It's it's on you if you want it to be successful. Yeah. And, and just, you know, I agree with that. And if anyone listening um, wants to be a studio owner, just know that it's going to be a learning curve and it's going to be something that you're either going to really find is for you or you're going to find that it is not for you. And at the beginning of this year, I let my studios go and I am so happy. I've, I eventually hated, I hated owning the studios It's like I was in this marriage with yoga and I used to be in love with it. And then I became a studio owner and I started to not be in love with yoga anymore. I was losing my practice. I really, really, everyone liked the studio except me. I hated this. I hated the studio because I owned it. And there's a whole bunch of reasons. And it's just the way I'm wired. And I know some people who own studios they love it. They're great at it. I, I couldn't stand it. Um, when I let go of the studios, it's almost like I'm back in love with yoga again. I will never get married to it, but we will have a nice long-term serious relationship. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. Um, <laughs> can you talk about some of the biggest things you learned you know, through the process of owning these studios? Wow. Okay. So just in general, well... I, there's two, it's like two different things from the from the first studio and then the second one. So I, I guess I'll talk more about the second one um, because that's you know really what I'm coming off of uh, in my mind, and because that's where we are right now in the current marketplace. And boutique yoga studios um, really are are suffering, and they're suffering because of. I, Again, I don't know if it's like this all over the place, but here in Charlotte, North Carolina, like the YMCA offers hot yoga. Like they offer the same type of yoga that you can find anywhere else um, as part of their membership. The gym offers yoga. The CrossFits offer yoga. But like everyone offers yoga. People are offering it in their subdivisions, you know, like on, on meetup, pa- you know, meetup pages. So it's like the value of the yoga studio for many people, especially if you're a smaller studio, uh, is tough. It, it just doesn't resonate with people. And now you have online as well, you know, and I think that's really where a lot of the industry is heading is, is online, online platforms, even in terms of gyms, there's going to be online gyms. Uh, you know, I'm connected with one right now. And I just think that's, that's what I could say right now in, mm-hmm. in my mind, like uh, as where the industry is and that, it it's it's a job that never ends when you own a studio, you know, because unless you make your teachers employees, you don't really have that much say as what an independent contractor can and cannot do or what you can tell them to do. So you have teachers canceling last minute, but you don't want your studio's name to be bad, so you got to come in and sub if you can, you know, whenever. And it's just it become I don't know, for me, again, I'm only speaking about me. There it could be different for for a lot of other people, but for me, it was like, ugh, a headache. It's just a constant headache. 
And when I cut myself free from them, I've been the happiest person since January 1st. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I've talked to a number of different studio owners on the podcast, and everyone has like a different sort of, I guess, opinion or experience with it. And I think that, you know, I've talked to people who still own studios who really love it. Like they, they, they love, you know, the challenge of it and the grind and the community. And of course, there's like, you know, trade offs to it where, you know, your karma cleaners cancel and you're the person who's scrubbing the floor at like 2am or changing the toilet paper because there's a class at 6am and it needs to happen. Um, And then there's, you know, a lot of people I've talked to you who went the studio ownership route and then they ended up selling because you know like yourself it wasn't for them and it kind of like made them not excited about yoga and I think that's really similar with teaching as well like I don't know for me I know that the 25 classes a week to try and make (laughs) ends meet is just not for me like I am a hundred percent sure that if I did that I would resent yoga like a hundred percent sure (laughs) I was doing it for a while um at at different stretches with each studio that I owned. And I swear to you, my wife has a picture of me. I'm on the couch and I'm like laying down, but I'm in big toe hole. I'm holding my big toe and somehow I'm like sleeping like that. Or at least I was passed out. Like I think I was (laughs) awake, but not really awake. And she snapped a picture and I'm just holding my leg because my body was so broken. But, and I was so mentally and physically exhausted yeah, from teaching I mean, that much. That's uh, if people people think about it like you know, if you work the average corporate job, you work about forty hours a week, and when you think about teaching, you're like, oh well, it's only twenty five hours a week. You know, it's kind of more like part time. But I think it's so so different. Like it's you know, a lot goes into teaching a class, and then you know, it's physically and emotionally and mentally exhausting to be there. And twenty five classes in a week, especially if you're at different studios, is a lot. Like a lot. It really is because you got to be fully present for people. And then, you know, also factor in it, if, if you are physically adjusting people, forget it. I mean, you're, you're just going to be toast after those 25 classes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. And so, so you let the studio go at the beginning of January and uh, you're feeling pretty good about that. So can you talk a little bit about, you know, kind of where you've headed since January and what you've been up to? Yeah. So um, I'm fortunate in a lot of ways, uh, you know, I'm married and, you know, uh, we have a home and as far as finances go, we're, we're cool. Um, so I'm in a place where I could kind of let the dust settle. And the way I I look at it is if I were driving on the highway for the last three years and I wanted to change directions, I wouldn't just go from 65 miles an hour and then put the car in reverse I would have to like gradually slow down and then get off the exit and then turn around. And that's kind of like what this has been since I made all these changes is like the dust settled and like everything kind of cleared. And organically, I fell into the podcast thing. I was a guest on, on my friend um, Tony's show and the Yogi Tones podcast. And then I had done radio for 10 years and I hadn't really done radio uh, probably in like four years. And after I did his show, I was like, man, that was fun. So I started helping him with his podcast. So I was like, just send me your audio. I'll edit it. You know, I have the programs. I love it. I love doing it. It's like, for me, it's like so much fun. And then eventually I was like, dude, I think I'm, I'm going to do my own podcast too. You know, and he's like, go for it. So I started doing it. And then now I'm like fully immersed in it. And it's like, I, I don't know. Like, it's all I do right now. It's all I have to do right now. I'm again, I'm lucky. Don't don't give up your day job to be a podcaster, but um <laughs> I can, I, know, can, I can vouch for that as well. <laughs> so, you, you, you know, but um I just love it. And I and I think that's part of the transition of whatever comes next in addition to this. Is like I'm in this place that if you're happy, you attract happy. So, whatever else is coming my way, it will be good, you know? Yeah. And I don't know exactly what that is right now, but man, I've been having a blast with the podcast. Yeah, that's that's amazing to hear. And something that just kind of, you know, clicked with me that I really like about your story is that it seems like you've done that you've really been able to kind of, you know, move into whatever direction is serving you 
at the time. Like you were doing teaching and then decided to do yoga teaching and then decided to do studio ownership and then came to a point where you're like recognizing that it's not for you and leaving that behind. And I think that I think that it's a lot easier to say those things than to do them. Like I think a lot of people have a hard time recognizing that this isn't serving me anymore and I'm going to stop doing it and I'm going to do something else that makes me happy. It seems like people are really, really attached to titles or to moving up in positions or like I've heard so many times even within I'm in my late 20s and people are like, well, I've been doing, you know, this thing for five years, so I might as well just stick with it. And I'm like, stick with it for how long? Like retirement (laughs) is until 65. Like you're just going to stick with this for like 40 years. (laughs) That's crazy. (laughs) Yeah, no, not. I mean, if you're if you're unhappy, like again, look, responsibilities um if you have children there's all different things that factor in to not just dropping everything um i think that everything that that i've done in reference to what you're talking about the changes that i've made have been planned out like it's not like it from the outside looking in like my friends that i haven't spoken to any in like you know during that time for two years they they say what are you up to now and then i tell them like really and it's like, well, no, but you see, I was planning it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, so like even, even with like eventually teaching yoga and, and going to a studio and making that my life, I kept my day job and I picked up more yoga teaching until I was ready. Like that was a process. It wasn't six days. It was like a year, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I think that's something that is really important to remember, especially in a time where, you know, we get frustrated if web pages take more than like three seconds to load (laughs) and people want to become Instagram famous within a day of having an Instagram account is that nothing happens overnight, but that it's Well, I'm 41, so maybe that's why. (laughs) (laughs) No, I mean, I I don't necessarily think that, I mean, maybe age has, has something to do with it, but I don't. I think that people want things to happen fast regardless, but I think that it's just remembering that, you know, if you want to make something happen, you can do it, but it's not going to happen overnight and right away, you know? Yeah. And it's even like, you know, some, I was talking to someone that I had on the podcast um, and they told me about the training that they did, the teacher training, and they got certified in 16 days. And I'm like, well, that's crazy because what about, like the life growth, the personal growth that happens in your life over the course of a six month training, right? Mm-hmm. So like that's a big piece of the puzzle. Like it's not just about teaching poses that you learn in 16, 16 days. So I said to them, I wasn't being mean. I, I just, the thing that came, that popped in my head was like, okay, well I can microwave a turkey burger or I could cook it for real, you know? And, and yes, it will still be cooked, through the microwave, but it just sucks compared to like cooking it the, the long real way, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And that's definitely. how I associate the quick trainings, you know? So yeah, the best things take time, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would agree with that for sure. I think, you know, if somebody out there is listening and they're kind of thinking, you know, I've maybe wanted to make a change in my career, but I just, you know, I feel a bit scared or I'm not sure how to set myself up, you know, financially or emotionally. Do you have any tips for kind of making those big changes? Well, again, everyone's wired differently. So anything that I say is going to be about myself and, and what resonates with me. So first I would say, do you, right? Like, like anything I say, take it with a grain of salt because ultimately you should be doing you and what, and what makes you tick and what's going to be best for you in your life. Mm-hmm. But I, I, I do think that there is something, you know, listening to your intuition, listening to your heart. If, if you've ever heard of people talk about the second brain in our stomach, the stomach brain. Yeah. Am I going way out there? Have you ever heard of that? Yeah. No, no, no. I've heard of it. It's like the idea that like we get that sensation in our stomach where it gives us this like really, if you tune into it, it can really tell you like kind of what you want. It's like when you walk into a job interview and you're like, Oh, this feels wrong but on paper it looks really good and you can either trust your gut or you can just go with what your head thinks yeah so i i I think that you know i i I, i'll sum it up in a quick story so you can't always go about what people tell you or what you perceive to be secure or safe that that's going to be best or make you happy i was doing radio 
and I was making more than enough money. I had a, I had a town hall, you know, I had bought a home. Uh, I could have stayed in that market forever. And something in me just said, I feel, I feel empty. I, ha- I got everything I wanted, but I feel empty. And I, I don't know. And I listened, but I went back to school for what I thought was safe, which would be teaching. And you know, unbeknownst to me and everybody else, during my time in grad school, the recession happened. And I couldn't get a job for what was supposed to be the safe route. So, so just because I chose the safe route and the secure route instead of traveling around as a radio host, which is not the safe route, I got handed a deck of cards that was broken. you know, And that was out of my control. So you don't know really what's going to happen on the external. So you might as well follow your, your internal you know, what, tr- what truly is going to make you happy and what truly you feel you're going to offer the world that, that that's your gift, that you're here to, that your, you, your purpose is to serve. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I love that. I think that too, you bring up a good point that, you know, of course, if, if somebody's struggling out there with making this decision, it's like, they can't just necessarily do what you did. That might not necessarily <laughs> be right. Um, Don't do anything that I've done. <laughs> <laughs> be honest with you (laughs) well that's not maybe that's not true (laughs) but i think it's the idea of like you know tune into what's right for you and follow that because following somebody else's path is no different than you know just being on a path that you know is wrong that you're just continuing to do you you know russell simmons uh the, the the guy who owned def jam records and he's a yogi um and, you know, his brother is run from run DMC. Uh, I, he has a couple of good books out. And he's also, if you type in into your music search, L-O-K-A, Loka, right? And then you put introduction by Russell Simmons. He talks in this introduction um, for about a minute. And he talks about how, one of, he says a couple of things. But one of the things that he says is, you know, money doesn't make you happy but happy makes you money, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and, and I just think that there's so much power in coming from that place. And, and that's coming from someone who is a media mogul and, and, you know, c- came to this place in his life where he found yoga because he had all of this success in his chaotic lifestyle and he was a mess, but he turned inside and he found this other path. And I think that there's a lot of power to that is that, you know, we got to stop chasing, you know, we got to stop chasing because everything we need it sounds cliche, but it, but everything we need is inside, and that's why we do yoga is, is to quiet, to quiet the mind and come to that place of stillness, which is really just a heightened sense of awareness. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. I love that. Thank you. And so I, I'm curious, this is kind of going a little bit back to when you were um, owning a studio, but I'm curious, you know, there's a lot of new yoga teachers who tune into the podcast and... I think that a lot of them, like one of the biggest things that I get asked is, you know, now I've got this teacher training, how do I get a job? And I think that like being a studio owner kind of gives this unique perspective. If somebody out there is looking for a studio job, what would you recommend for kind of the process of going about actually getting a job at a studio? It's such a good question. And I have such a good example of of who I hired. Um, In the first studio, when I, you know, was looking for teachers because I pretty much cleared out all the other ones. Um, this girl, she had done her training and my wife was at the front desk that day. She, she sometimes she would work the front desk and this girl, Amanda, who I affectionately referred to as Saint Amanda eventually, cause she was like the best team member ever. Um, walked in and said, I just graduated training and I'm just looking to teach. And she just showed up and you know, she taught a demo lesson and I was like, I really like her as a person and we'll work with her on her skills as a teacher. And man, watching her grow during the time that she taught for us while we had the studios was the best thing. And I, and, and I bring her up because she got the job just by walking into the studio. Like, like to me, that's humility and, and it's, and it's drive and hunger, you know, she didn't expect anything, but she got it. Yeah, definitely. That's a great example. And so do you feel like, like really going to the studio, connecting with the studio owner and the students and the other teachers is kind of the best way to like find if you fit there and, and getting that job? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think certainly um, as far as a studio goes, every studio has got a different vibe. So you certainly should feel like that's a place where you would want to practice. Um, I think it's a shame sometimes when teachers um, teach at a studio, but they don't practice there. Mm-hmm. I, I, I think it's just it, it's a poor representation um, in a lot of ways. I think it's great when you see the teachers at a studio who who teach there regularly when they're in class next to you. I think that says a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think you should feel like you like that studio has got your vibe. And if it doesn't click like that, there's a ton of other studios. And the other thing I would say is if you really want to start teaching like you did, offer the free classes, teach wherever you can, where, wherever you can, or teach at a gym, the YMCA, like don't like, don't start at, don't think you need to start at the top, you know, to be humble, you know, go out and get your experience however and whenever and wherever you can get it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think too, it's like great to do any type of swap that you can as well. Like, ask your hairdresser if you can swap, you know, a haircut for a private lesson or... Oh, you're good. I, I didn't even think of that. I got to start doing that. <laughs> I swapped logo design <laughs> for a private lesson. Like the girl who actually designed uh, my MBOM logo, like she's a, like a, she was just starting out with graphic design and um, I was just starting out with teaching. And so like, why don't we, or starting out with privates, I guess I'd been teaching for a while at that point, but starting out with privates and it's like, why don't we just swap this? Like, you know, instead of you paying me some money, why don't we both get something out of it that we're going to benefit from? Wow, that's crazy. I don't think I've ever thought to do that. (laughs) There we go. This is why you have the business of yoga podcasts. And I have the goofy, fun, jokey yoga podcasts. (laughs) (laughs) No, I love that, though. I think it's just, you know, go out, go out and teach as much as you can, especially when you're new. I actually wish that I would have done like more of that. Um, when I was a new newer teacher and I'm still not like I've only been teaching for three years. So I'm definitely still in the category of new teacher. So I for sure still do things like that. But when I was like first starting out, I wish that I would have done more of that. But, but, you know, also that that's really genius on your part. Um, not to say that no one else has ever done it, but I really think it's forward thinking by you. It's smart. And that it's outside the box because it's not the first thing that someone would think of. At least I didn't. And, People create meetup pages and they offer yoga, you know, to certain neighborhoods or, you know, they, they just I mean, look at the world we live in. There's so many ways to get your message out. So just don't have tunnel vision mm-hmm. that there's only one path because there's so many, so many different ways to go about this thing. There really is. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And so can you tell people a little bit about your podcast, you know, how you started it, what your sort of mission behind it is and what it's all about? <laughs> sure. So um, my studio and company was was called Yoga Moves You. So I started the Yoga Moves You podcast and um, our tagline is um, – what is our tagline? No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> real people, real stories, real yoga. And it's, it's like everything is yoga centric, but it's probably more human centric interweaved with yoga. So it's like, I'm not just going to get like, you know, a person because they're just interesting to have on the show, but they don't do yoga. You know what I mean? Like, like there is, there's always yoga as, as the binding thread. But we definitely are not the podcast that's going to talk about, you know, poses and, and like some of the more, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, mechanical ones or, or fundamental, um, which are great. You know, there's, there, there's a lot of great yoga podcasts. Um, I think ours is more um, entertaining to listen to. It's a fun listen. So I, I think that depending on the guests – you know, I'm, I'm always looking just to get who they are as a person and their story. And then somehow the yoga ends up making its way at some point in their life. And I'm looking for what moment that was, mm-hmm. um, you know, and, and, you know, we'll definitely have a few laughs usually somewhere during, during the podcast. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, it, we're definitely not one of the preachier podcasts. Uh, and that's just me. I'm not, I, you know, I did radio for 10 years on a top 40 station. And I, I just think that I bring that flavor into the world of 
a yoga podcast or a podcast that is centered around yoga and the people that are around yoga because the people that are around yoga are all different, you know? Mm-hmm. And yeah, it's fasc- definitely. Fascinating to me. Um, all the all the different guests that we've had on and the different styles of yoga and the different stories that led them to yoga. Um, it's just so interesting. It's yeah. just people. Yeah, I mean, I would 100% agree with that. It's It's one of the questions that I always ask people because I think that finding out how somebody came to yoga and what inspired them to become a teacher is is so interesting. I feel like it kind of tells a lot about a person hearing that story. And I love that that story is so unique to everyone. Like everyone who's become a yoga teacher has gone through a 200 hour training that has covered relatively the same stuff. But the reason yeah. why they got there is so, so interesting. Yes. And I think maybe without saying it, you just said what I'm looking to do. Like I I say, I'm looking for the stories about people and their lives, you know, and like how they grew up and like really what molded them and shaped them as they function as an adult. And then eventually what brought them to yoga. But uh, you, you pretty much summed it up um, very nicely. That's really what I'm looking, what I'm interested in on our podcast. Yeah. One of the things that I really love about podcasting I mean, over radio, I think a little bit is that you can really allow your personality as a host to shine through and really have your show be about whatever you want. And I'm sure you had this experience in radio to some degree where you can, you know, be your own personality and stuff. Um, But I think that it's just a lot more free to do that via podcast. And it's really cool that there's this market where, you know, there's a bunch of different yoga podcasts out there, but people are going to tune into mine for something different than they're going to tune into yours um, and all the other ones out there. And I think there's so much room for different podcasts. So that's really awesome that you're doing that. No, you're totally right about radio. I mean, commercial radio is, you know, you have the, the programmers and the DJs, on or the hosts on one side of the building and you have the suits, the salespeople on the other side and they're going to sell you out. So you're, you're getting the ratings and then they sell an endorsement that you have to speak about that you do not care about that product, but you've got to, it's paying, it's, it's putting you, putting some cash into your paycheck and you're like talking about this thing. Like you love it because you have to, mm-hmm. you know, and like that would never happen on a podcast unless you really had a really lucrative deal. I mean, you might have to fake it a little bit, but, but you know, <laughs> essentially, at the, from the from the ground roots, you know, any any endorsement or any advertiser that you're lucky enough to get, you're really going to be promoting things that you actually care about, you know. And I think that that permeates, you know, commercial radio to to an extent, you know, like especially if you're on like I was on a top forty station. Eventually, I was a morning host, morning show host, and that's when you could talk more. However, the stuff that we had to talk about had to kind of be in line with that demographic of the, the listeners who would listen to a top 40 radio station as opposed to a rock station or, you know, a, a news talk station. So you, you, you're confined, definitely, much mm-hmm. more than you are in a podcast. Yeah, for sure. And what do you feel like has been the biggest learnings through hosting this yoga podcast so far? Wow. One of the most... Um, gratifying things and one of the things uh, as far as learning has been interviewing people from different parts of the world I I love it like it's so freaking amazing to me because I grew up half my life without it I didn't have internet till I was 19 so I grew up half my life without it half with it and the fact that I can interview someone in London you know or interview someone in in Denmark or, or Australia it blows my freaking mind and I think that talking about the, this thing that we're we're equally passionate about and hearing their their stories and you know their their thoughts and, and travels with yoga throughout the world has really been educational and and also and also extremely um again gratifying. Yeah, yeah, I would I mean second that as a podcast host as well. It's like I mean it's amazing the fact that the fact that I'm in Mexico City and you're in Charlotte is pretty amazing that we can connect. But I find it even more so when I talk to somebody who's in like Australia or Asia or something like that. And they're on like, you know, it's a different day of the week. And we're able to talk through this like crazy wireless thing. And I'm able to record it and put it out for other people to hear. It's so cool. I think that's what I like too. like, um, which I agree with what you what, what you said. And you, you mentioned that, that you, you can record and put it out. And I think that... Um, 
when we're young, we crave something that we that we don't have. And for me, in my story, I'm the youngest out of like four boys. And for me, I craved the need to, to, to be heard because I was like seven years younger than the other brother. And like, but by the time they got to me, I was just like an ad, an ad a child, you know? And like, I never really had control over my life. And I was kind of like, my dad retired the same year I graduated high school. And I was like, we're selling the house, moving to Florida. It's like, I got cut. So it's like whatever I wanted and, and like my voice to be heard, I never had that. So I think that's what I craved and still do as, as an adult is, is to c- have control and direction of my life. Like you're talking about making the changes in my life and, and also to, to the need to be heard. So I think that's really a driving force behind doing this as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's, yeah, that's amazing. Thanks for sharing that. Sure. Is there anything else that you want to share about, you know, anything you've learned as a yoga teacher, a studio owner, and now as a yoga podcast host? Wow. Um, It's a big question. (laughs) I think I'm going to address teachers because that's probably a big part of who's listening to your podcast. And again, you know, if you're a new teacher, just realize that we're probably at the pinnacle of teacher saturation and that this is not to discourage you. It's to encourage you to be creative and, and listen to what Amanda says because she says a lot of great things on our podcast on how to be successful um, as a yoga teacher and to break in and then to thrive. Um, pay attention to people like Amanda and, and, and podcasts and all these other resources that you have. Be humble. You know, um, I, I remember as a studio owner, I had one of the more experienced teachers. Um, she had like a yoga DVD out in like 2006. She came in and brought in her DVDs <laughs> to my studio. And she's like, oh, I used to own a studio. I had to clean the toilets. I was like, so? I clean the toilets? I mean, I mean like... Don't th- don't think that anything needs to be glamorous. Like come into it that you'll do whatever you need to do to give you the joy of what you trained to do, which is teach and, and give this to people, you know? And I think everything good will come from that place. Yeah, definitely. I agree come, with that. Come, yeah. come from a place of, of, of how you can add value instead of what you can take. Yeah. And you'll end up getting and you'll end up getting more in the end. Yeah, for sure. I love that. And thank you for the shout out, by the way. <laughs> Yeah, no doubt. No, 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 it's true. (laughs) Cool. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you so much for your time today, Andrew. Um, If people want to learn more about you and listen to your podcast, uh, where can they go to find you? Yeah, so we are uh, on all the platforms, the Yoga Moves You podcast on Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, the Google, what is it? Is it Google Play, Google Podcast? I don't Um, even know what it's called. Or not. Yeah, Google Um, Play, I think. Yeah, Google Play. Or you could go to like our main page where, you know, we do a little bit of blogging and we have some visual stuff too, which is, um, we, I used to use the regular page, but now I use the Podbean page. So it's yoga moves you dot podbean dot com. Okay, um, perfect. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, and on uh, Insta- Instagram, it's like the yoga moves you podcast or just yoga moves you. I don't know. Something will show up. Okay. <laughs> I'll put links to it in the show notes and that sort of thing so people can find you. It's been a pleasure. I'm so happy that you had me on to connect and um, keep doing what you're doing. I really think that there's so much value to your podcast specifically. There really is for Thank people you. that yeah. want to make something out of themselves in the business sense of yoga, for sure. Thank you so much. And thank you for your you're time welcome. today. Absolutely. Thanks so much, man. It's been a pleasure. All right, guys, I hope that you enjoyed that episode of the podcast with podcast host Andrew Gordon from Yoga Moves You. Make sure you go check out what he's up to and all of the awesome episodes that he offers. His podcast is a little bit different style than MBOM, but definitely some amazing teachers over there that um, I think you guys will really enjoy. Once again, thank you so much to our sponsors, Fave Yogis. Make sure you go check them out. And don't forget Yoga Business Bootcamp and the Teacher Training with Yoga Goddess Academy is out and live and I would love for you to check them out. Thanks so, so much for listening to today's episode of the show and for listening every single week. I'm so, so grateful for everyone who tunes in. You can find show notes and notes and links and all that good 
stuff, blog posts up at the website at www.mbomyoga.com. As always, you can find me on social media at Mastering the Business of Yoga and join the private Facebook community at Yoga Business Badasses. Have a great week and namaste.